God hears prayer. God answers prayer. Have faith. Trust in God. Believe in God. For truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, now he could be pointing at the Mount of Olives as a symbol, literally, but also, beloved, metaphorically. Jesus could be speaking metaphorically of some mountain that's in our way. Maybe it's a diagnosis. Maybe it's a pink slip. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Whatever it might be, something seems like a mountain. There's no way we can get around it. If you speak to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. Jesus said, say into this mountain, be cast into the sea and it will be done. There's power in prayer. Not because of our prayers, not because of our words, what we say, but because of the power of him who we pray to. There's power in prayer. What mountain is in your life this morning? Thank you for uh, coming out. For uh, those who don't know me, and I think uh, most of you do, uh, my name is Anil George. Uh, my wife, Bibby, and I and our three children have been attending here since uh, 2001. And uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, grateful for this opportunity to be here. Um, I work at uh, Krauss Hospital. I'm an interventional cardiologist, which is a fancy way to say that I'm a cardiologist who is a plumber. I put stents in people's clogged arteries. And um, I'm here today to uh, thank everybody and to uh, just share my testimony. On April 4th, uh, while at the hospital, I had a stroke. And uh, God miraculously healed me and gave me deliverance. And I'm uh, here to just talk about everything that happened. I want to first, before I start, just thank everyone, uh, my family who came from all over. They were such a strong support. Our church family, friends, patients. The staff at Kraus really treated me like royalty. Um, whether it was people in our office, my nurse, my nurse practitioner, um, so many people just came all around me and just enveloped me with their love and kindness and our whole family, and I want to thank you. You know, in the cath lab, uh, there's three of us who do these uh, procedures, and so the running joke, which I made up, was that uh, we have uh, King uh, Joseph and Prince John, and I'm the wicked stepchild. So whenever I would ask for new equipment or something, they would always say there's not money in the budget, but for those two, they got everything. Um, but I got to tell you, after this event and the way they took care of me, there's nothing I can say except uh, that they do really love me and I'm no longer the wicked stepchild. Um, so, and I want to also thank my partners. Um, so many of them came and, uh, you know, they're not my partners and colleagues, but they're truly my family and that's what I sent a message to them in, in the text. It's, it's more than just a partnership at work. They really just came around me and they were so supportive, so I want to thank you for that. Um, I also want to thank uh, Pastor Ken and Pastor Stephen for this opportunity that I have to be up here. Um, Pastor Ken usually doesn't let me get up because I start to talk and I don't stop. Um, so if I go over, forgive me. And I also talk really fast when I get uh, stressed and anxious and have a lot to say, so forgive me for that as well. Um, so what I'd like to talk about as I thought about what happened to me exactly a month and a day ago is uh, about brokenness. Is life unfair? Is God unfair? So a couple years ago I had a patient who, uh, it was her 70th birthday. Uh, the whole restaurant was rented out, all her family was there, and during the, uh, during the party, she suddenly passed out. She came to after a few minutes. The EMS people came, and the lady said, I'm not leaving, it's my birthday, so the EMS people left. About 10, 15 minutes later, she passed out again. And again, the EMTs came, and she said, no, I'm not going, this is my party, I, this was all planned for so long, so they left again. Third time, about 10 minutes later, happened again. This time, everybody said, the party's over, you're going to the hospital. So I go down to the Krauss Emergency Department and I walk into this lady's room and she goes into a lethal heart rhythm and she just passes out in front of me. I grab the paddles, we shock her and she comes back and she's having a big heart attack. We take her down to the lab, we put a stent in her and I ask her at the end of that, I say, do you believe in miracles? She, she died four times and she's come back. And she said, no, because if God was here, then why would all this bad stuff happen around us? I don't understand why a good God would allow these things to happen. So I want to uh, kind of give you three stories, two from the Bible and one of my own life and kind of tie them all in. And I would say that that's a good question. I mean, and I wrestled with this last uh, 
September, October, November, I started watching the nightly news and I kind of wondered myself, like, is God fair? This is horrific. And now I get nightmares. I can't even watch the news anymore. Um, so I'm going to read three portions. The first is from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 32. Once again, Genesis chapter 32, 22 to 32. That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of the Jabot. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he replied. The man then said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Another portion from John chapter 5, 1 to 9, the New Testament, John chapter 5, 1 to 9. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath, and so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it is a Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see you are well again, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord. I pray that you would just speak to our hearts, Lord, and help us to understand and see what you want us to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, April 4th is a life-changing day for me. Um, my family, friends, everybody who knows me knows that my schedule's crazy. I am like the Energizer Bunny on uh, Turbo Boost. I never sit still. Uh, I'm always going, going, going. Uh, April 3rd was a crazy busy day. April 4th was going to be even a busier day. I had to work in the lab in the morning, see patients in the afternoon. Then our son Daniel, who's 10, had to uh, do a science project at school. And then Rachel had an honors uh, thing at CBA, so it was a jam-packed day. And then the following day, my wife and I were going to go to Seattle for her uncle's funeral. So we were going to jump on a plane and then take a red eye back Saturday night and plan to be in church so I can give a couple announcements. So that's a typical uh, long weekend for me. But God had different plans. I had finished a couple cases on uh, Thursday morning, and I said, let me get some food to eat because the next case I was going to do was really complicated. So I went downstairs, and as I was coming back to the cath lab where we do our procedures, I was walking, and all of a sudden, I feel this bubbling going on in my head. And I said, this is strange. I never get hypoglycemic or feel like my sugar's low like this. And I took a couple more steps, and I get to the table where I'm going to try to put the food down, and the table is moving. So I kind of hold the table, the food out, and I just drop it. And as I'm looking at the food and the, and the plate, all of a sudden, I see this liquid that's dripping down out of the corner of my eye. And I'm thinking, what is this? Is my nose running? Is the ceiling leaking? But after a couple of drips, I knew what was happening. My face was drooping, and this was, I was drooling. Suddenly, the ground became a little shaky, and I had to sit down on the chair. And as I turned around and pivoted around, there was a nurse standing at the door. Now, our room is a little bit set back, so usually the nurses are really busy and running around. They're not standing there looking at me. And I said in first service, usually when I need something, I just start screaming, help, help. And they know I'm a drama queen, and they usually uh, just lounge over whenever they can. But in this case, in this day, there was a nurse standing right there looking at me. And she said, are you okay? And I opened my mouth, and I could not say any words. 
My tongue was pointed all the way to one side. And as she came in, all I could say to her was neuro, neuro, neuro. I knew what was going on. I was having a stroke. So they threw me in a stretcher. I've not seen my nurses move this fast. One of our nurse practitioners leaped over a stretcher. It was kind of like the commercial we say way back in the day. Uh, and they rushed me upstairs and within 10 minutes, 11 minutes to be exact, I got a clot busting medication. And within an hour, God restored my speech completely. So uh, before I go on, I'm gonna invite Bibi up because she was called by one of our partners to come in. Um, and so she was there just before I'm getting my clot busting medication. And just so you can get a perspective how things look from her end, so. During the month of March, I found myself enjoying a song on the Christian radio station that I tune into regularly. It was by a band called Cutlass. The song is titled, King of My Heart and the lyrics proclaim God's goodness with the words, you are good, being sung over and over. I enjoyed singing along. It was easy to sing that God was good when my life was good and peaceful. Little did I know that in a few weeks, I would be going through a storm that would cause me to question if God truly was good. On April 4th, shortly before noon, my routine day at work was interrupted by a harsh and persistent knock on the door. It was one of the secretaries explaining that I had an urgent phone call from the hospital, and this call was not regarding any of my patients. Somewhat puzzled, I hastened to the phone. It was one of Anil's partners from work explaining that I needed to get to the Krauss Hospital emergency room immediately, as Anil had been taken there. As I started to make the short five-minute drive up to the hospital, all I could pray was a two-line prayer. I prayed that the Lord would be with Anil and that he would give me the faith and strength to face whatever was coming my way. While my instincts told me that this had to be something serious, else I would not have been asked to rush to the hospital, I was still hoping that it would be something that turned out to be nothing. The scene, however, that faced me as I walked into the ER dispelled that hope almost immediately. There was a sea of physicians, nurses, specialists, several of the physicians and nurses that worked with Anil daily. I knew now that this was quite serious. They told me that the tests had confirmed that Anil was having a stroke. I looked at my husband of 18 years and my best friend of 24 years laying on the stretcher. His face was contorted, um, and um, he was unable to form any words. The smile that had lit up my life for all those years was gone, and the person who was always able to comfort me was unable to speak any words of comfort. As the reality of what was happening sank in, all I could now muster was a one-word prayer, and that was to call in the name of Jesus. Now that the diagnosis had been made, all the medical knowledge that I had accumulated over the past 25 years could in no way come to my assistance. In fact, it only added to my fears and anxiety as I thought about the consequences and potential complications of a stroke. I knew at that moment I needed a different knowledge, the knowledge of what I had learned as a child from the stories in the Bible. One of my favorites was about Jesus calming the storm. I looked at the scene around me and realized that I was in a storm. I prayed that the Lord would help me keep my focus on him and to trust that he was in control. Almost immediately, the scene that looked so frightening as I had walked in now looked different in my eyes. In fact, it was a comforting scene. I realized that this event had happened right in the hospital where Anil was working that day. He was surrounded by physicians and nurses that knew him well and would take the best possible care they could. Had this event happened just 24 hours later, we would have been on a flight to Seattle to my uncle's funeral. We would either have been on the flight or somewhere between Syracuse and Seattle without any of these familiar faces around us. I felt the Lord comforting me with his presence and the knowledge that he was already in control of the storm. I also felt the comfort of several of Anil's colleagues, physicians and nurses, even a social worker that never left my side through all this. I thank the Lord for opening my eyes to see this truth. I now needed the prayers of other believers. 
I called my family, and those parents who are prayer warriors, my brother in Dallas who reassured me that he would let all our family know and would be on the next flight to Syracuse. I also wanted my church family to pray. Angela McCall was the first name in my directory, and although she was going through a storm herself with losing her brother, she too reassured me that she would be praying and that she would get the word out. The next step was to give Anil the medication to help break up the clot that had traveled to his brain. Once again, I was gripped by fear and anxiety as I thought of the complications of this very powerful blood thinner. It could cause massive internal bleeding. One of my favorite hymns as a child was Standing on the Promises of God. The words are, standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God, I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. I realized that I could either stand on the problem that I was facing or that I could stand on the promises of God. But what were those promises? It was hard to remember when fear was trying to take control. Once again, I could feel the supernatural peace of God that I knew was the effect of the prayers of my fellow believers. I remembered that the Lord had promised never to leave or to forsake. Sometimes our faith is strengthened by past experiences. The last time I had to hold on to that promise, when almost 20 years ago, I had another phone call, this one informing me that my father had passed away. I remember during that very dark time, my mother, a woman of faith, had taught her three children that God would never leave us nor forsake us. I remember that the Lord had truly helped me and my family as we made our move to this country, and he had seen us through. That same God was holding my hand through this dark time. What was happening around me seemed bad, but I was able to remember that God was truly good, and that even when things seem bad, he works all things together for the good of those who love him. What was happening to Anil seemed wrong, but I remembered that God is right. He is righteous, and his ways are perfect. As I signed the consent for treatment, I knew that there was nothing I could do but to trust in God's promises, to be still, and know that he was God. I knew that I did not know the outcome, but the one I trusted and did. Strengthened in my own faith, I was finally able to look at Anil and comfort him and reassure him that the Lord was with us and that he was going to see us through. Within minutes, Anil's facial weakness started to get better, and he was able to speak. I was able to see the miracle of faith working through modern medicine. I heard it once said that faith produces miracles, but miracles do not produce faith. In the days and weeks that followed, we were overwhelmed by the tremendous outpouring of love and support from our family, church, friends, and colleagues from work. We were blessed with so much spiritual encouragement, physical nourishment. This included prayers, Bible verses, text messages, songs, flowers, and so much food. Words cannot express the debt of gratitude that we feel for all of you who have truly been the hands, heart, and feet of Christ to us during this trial. But may the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and his name alone be glorified forever and ever. As I'm laying there on the uh, stretcher, waiting to get the clot-busting medication, I'm looking around. And I see my partners, I see doctors, nurses, they all look as pale as can be. And so I couldn't imagine what my face looked like for them to be looking like that. And I looked over at Bibi and I, there was something different about the way that she looked. There was a glow, there was a peace. Initially I was like, is it just because she's brown and everybody else is white? But after a few moments, I said, no, there's, there's something that's just radiating from her, just a strength. And I was able to just catch on. I just put my gaze on her. And throughout a lot of the time, I just looked at her and I gained strength from the strength that she's given me and because of our uh, Savior, Jesus Christ. So I gave you three stories. One man was crippled. One man was healed. The story, third story is my life. I was crippled and I was healed. How does this make sense? Can a God who is supposed to be good allow such circumstances? We look around and see horrific things happening in our world and in our lives and wonder how a good God can be in control. I want to just highlight a couple of different things from these different stories, including my own. 
uh, that you can uh, all relate with. The first thing is that all of these stories show brokenness. Though Jacob was loved by God, and God was always watching out for them, Jacob was a broken man. He was a runner. He was always escaping bad situations. His father, his name, I'm sorry, means deceiver, liar, or thief. He tricked his father and mother into uh, giving him the uh, birthright of his older brother. When his brother heard about that, he wanted to kill him, so he ran away from home to his uncle's place. His uncle was even a bigger schemer than him and made him work for 14 years before he gave him his two daughters in marriage. And his uncle started getting angry with him, and so once again, Jacob was running away from him. And as he went back, he had to go back and face his brother, and that's the story that we read when he's fighting with God. Before he meets his brother, he's there and asking God to bless him. Here's a man who was estranged from his parents because of his lies and his deception. He was estranged from his brother, and now he was estranged from his uncle slash father-in-law. Jacob was somebody who was never willing to give up control. He always wanted to control the circumstances, though he loved and trusted God. What about the lame man? When the pool would be stirred, whoever got in first would be miraculously healed. He laid there for 38 years with no one to help him into the pool. He was broken physically, mentally, emotionally, and relationally. He couldn't move. He was broken not only on the inside, but also on, not only on the outside, but also the inside. What about me? From the outside, you may think I was far from broken with a nearly perfect life. TV stars may call me because of the Krauss commercial, doctor, amazing wife, children, extended family, house, cars. What more could a person want than what I had in my life? I'll be honest, I'm generally a very reserved person. I rarely let my card show. I've always felt that I have to deal with things and take care of things myself. My presence on this podium inviting all of you is out of character for me. It's hard as a healthcare provider to be weak because so many we take care of depend on us and sometimes we feel like their lives depend on it. In the 11 years going back before January, I've only taken one day of sick leave. There are days when I would be so sick that I would go into my office and have them put an IV and give me a bag or two of fluid before I'd go work just so I could stay upright. I was a person who knew that God was in control and I, that I was in his hands, but I was always ready to help him out. My family and friends will tell you of my crazy schedules and plans. Whenever there was an insurmountable situation, I would be find 10 ways around it so that we can make sure that it worked. Though God had abundantly and has abundantly blessed me, deep inside I have the same struggles that we all do. In my mind, I'm not a TV star. I'm the high school kid from West Genesee who nobody would share a seat with. So I had to stand on several occasions in the back of the bus to ride to school. I'm the guy who was overweight, scar-faced, and never quite fit into any group. My parents are the most amazing people. They gave me a glimpse of unconditional love. They sacrificed everything to this day in their lives for me and my brother. I will forever be grateful for their faith and the love they have shown to me. However, there were immigrants from India who didn't understand the American culture or the things that I went through. I felt my culture and my faith never let me fully fit in. My only outlet was basketball, and honestly, I was never really that good at that either. What about each of you out there? I doubt anybody would say that life is great and perfect, and even if it is now, there's always a curveball around the corner. Are you broken like me and Jacob and the lame man? We sometimes try so hard to paint such a beautiful picture of our lives on the outside, whether it's using social media or some other avenue to make ourselves and the world think that everything is great. Yet when the cameras go off and the music fades away, when we lay awake at night and think about our lives, do you see brokenness like I do? Can the things on the outside, our accomplishments, possessions, beauty, relationships really bring us happiness? I would argue no. If you don't believe me, just look at the number of movie stars and music stars who we think have it all, who end up taking their lives and have horrific struggles with substance abuse. They, just like us, struggle despite what we think of them having everything. We are all broken, torn apart on the inside, no matter how we may look on the outside. So the first common thing is brokenness. 
The second is sin. What can we say about the two in the Bible? Both were sinners. Jacob was a deceiver, a liar, and a cheat. Jesus tells a lame man later on to sin no more. I am a sinner. We are all sinners. We've all messed up. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Will you all admit with me that we've all messed up and no one is perfect? A couple people said to me in the hospital, it makes no sense that bad things happen to good people and and the bad people seem to get away with everything without any consequences. Some of us may feel like we do good or are good, but the question is, how do we define good? My definition may be different than that of the serial killer who is in prison, which is different from the head of the drug cartel. Your view is different than mine. So what is our standard? How do we know what good is? Some may say Hitler. Some may say Mother Teresa. Others may say Billy Graham. If a human being is a standard, then I would argue that we're all in really big trouble. What if God is our standard? He is perfect, and that is how we would define him. Who could meet that standard? That is also very scary, isn't it? All of us are messed up from the best person you can think of to the worst in the world. There is no standard for good. So we're all broken. We're all sinners. The third is that God meets us in our darkest places. The Bible doesn't promise that there will not be challenges and difficulties in our lives. God promises that every, doesn't promise that everything will be perfect, but he does promise to be there with us. The question is, what kind of God do we serve? One that will stand back with arms folded and smirk as we suffer and struggle? Or is he right there next to us, carrying us through our struggles? After wrestling all night, Jacob was asked by God what his name was. And he finally had to admit that it was Jacob, that he was a liar and a cheat, and he was a runner. He was hustling and swindling everybody and running away. He was stuck on both sides, his father-in-law who hated him on one, and his brother who was waiting to kill him on the other. What about the lame man? You could see there that Jesus asked the lame man if he wants to get well. That sounds like a ridiculous question that Jesus would ask him who's supposed to be God. 38 years the guy is laying there, but listen to the, uh, the person's response. He said, Sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. That's not the response I would get if I was laying somewhere for 38 years and somebody asked me if I wanted to get well. I would say yes. This man was so dejected, he was so lost in his circumstances and defeated that he started complaining of the circumstances and why things were unfair for him. He had no idea who he was talking to him and called him sir. He didn't realize that he was Jesus. He was relying on the water and not on God. What about me? I'm someone given my profession and position who is always making the decisions, always supposed to be in control always helping others. As I said earlier, until I met Bibi, life was about me holding everything in and keeping others out. She struggled a lot to to make a stubborn mule like me to get to where I am today. And I still have a long way to go. She'll tell you that. The first seconds I had symptoms, I wanted to ignore them like all good physicians. You ignore something long enough, it'll go away. You just have to take care of everybody else. But soon I realized that this was something I couldn't control. For the first time in my life, I had to give up control of what was happening to me. As I lay there in the CAT scanner, I knew there was nothing I could do. My degree, my wife, my children, my possessions, nothing could help me. I was fully in God's hands. Can I tell you without a doubt, I really felt his presence with me there. I couldn't sing because every time I stuck my tongue out, it was veering to one side. Bibi would tell you that I couldn't sing even if it was pointing straight, but that's a different story. (laughs) And she's, she's absolutely correct. As I laid there, even though I couldn't sing, I hummed the song, You Are My All in All. Listen to some of the words. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. It was amazing that despite the chaos of the circumstances, there was a beautiful calmness inside me. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) It was a supernatural peace. Even when I couldn't speak to anyone, 
I could speak with my Father in heaven. I didn't have to say a word out loud. I had a peace that there was somebody far greater than anyone there that was in control. And I knew no matter what would happen to me that he was in control. I didn't see heaven. I didn't see any bright lights. But I felt like I was in a very dark, deep pit covered in quicksand. And I couldn't move. I had to lay really still. And there was no way out but up. But above me, there was somebody holding on to me so strongly, I knew that I would not be let go. People asked me if I was terrified. I wasn't. I was sad. I was a bit afraid, unsure of what was happening. But there was something there at that day that superseded my fear. And I can't explain it in words. We talked about brokenness and sin and God being there in the valleys. Finally, I want to talk about restoration. Jacob had a limp the rest of his life. After asking Jacob his name and he admitting that he was a liar and a thief, God changed his name to Israel, which has several translations, including God rules and a man seeing God. <coughs> Jacob had to finally admit that he was a liar and a cheat. And with every limp thereafter, he would have to remember that not he, but God was in control. He sees Esau, his older brother. It was a friendly and peaceful meeting. He didn't kill him. God changed his character from a liar and a deceiver to someone who, would have, who he would have to trust in for every step that he took. Though he found favor all his life with God and he was blessed, now he had to fully rely on God and not himself. God then uses Jacob's lineage to build a nation of Israel, which to this day is a mighty nation. God also brought Jesus into the world through the lineage of this lying cheat. But God had to change his character from Jacob to Israel before he could complete his work through Jacob. What about the lame man? Because of his disability, he was lost and in despair. He didn't see or know who Jesus was or what was happening to him. As I said earlier, he called him sir and told those who were questioning him later that he didn't know who healed him. He only saw his circumstances. He was so lost and broken and defeated. After he was healed, the Bible says, Jesus finds him in the temple. It is there that the man realizes who saved him and restored him. Jesus not only healed his legs, but changed his circumstances and redirected his paths. As I lay there, I saw my wife. And I longed for just one more look at my children. To hug them and to tell them that I love them. I asked Bibby to tell them in my slurred voice to tell them that I love them. That was the only thing I said. My children have been strong, in many ways stronger than me. They have been a pillar of support. I can see the faith in their eyes and the strength in their hearts. A couple days after this all happened, Ian, my youngest, who was seven, said, Dad, every couple days, my eyes would well up with tears. And it broke my heart. My kids know very well that I love them more than anything in this world. Sometimes I push them to be perfect, and they know how to push my buttons as well. I am learning, though, to let go of the little things and to sometimes take my shoes off and get in the mud with them instead of always trying to pull them out. Some advice I'd give to all of you is to love your children as unconditionally as possible. If you have young kids, don't let their best friends be their iPads or Xboxes or strangers. They're going to grow up really fast. Love them with all that you have, and they will love you back. Finally, I would say don't be afraid to let your kids see your weaknesses and your failures because it's in that it's in that, that they will build their character and God can be glorified. God restored me that day on April 4th. My tongue, which was bound, within an hour was loosed. My fear of sharing my faith was conquered in all of you hearing my story today. God has taught me a lot about the important things of life, not to worry about the small things. I don't have to get through the million things on my list. It's okay to leave some things for tomorrow. He also showed me a lot about relationships, all of you guys here, listening, calling, doing so much. I realize the value and the importance of relationships. And I would encourage you, if you have broken relationships, to go back and mend them. Because you don't want somebody coming to your funeral feeling bad that they didn't 
and you don't want to go to somebody's funeral regretting that you didn't try either. Yesterday and tomorrow will never be as important as today because yesterday is gone and tomorrow may never come. I know his restoration process in my life is only beginning. I'm excited to see what he has store for me and my family. He set up the perfect circumstance for me to manifest this defect in my heart which was treated. I was born with a little hole in my heart. We all are actually born with that hole. And in about 20% of the people, that hole doesn't close. Many of you may have read the story about Howard Washington from the SU basketball team. That's my story as well. I could have been in any other circumstance and this would have been a whole different story. As I said, exactly 24 hours later, we would have been 30,000 feet in the sky going from Minneapolis to Seattle. To me, that is not a coincidence. As I laid there and my partner, Dr. Battaglia, was about to go in and close my hole, I was thinking, boy, this is crazy. I wanted to get up and run away. And then as I thought about it, I said, the only thing crazier than this is that this is what I do for a living. So what is really wrong with me? And on top of all that, I declined any sedation so I can watch him close my hole. So you could see I really have problems. Uh, so. <laughs> God has allowed me to have a new appreciation for what it's like also to be on the other side to, of the bed with my patients. And I'm praying <coughs> excuse me, that he would give me more of a, uh, a, a love and a compassion for them more than what he has given me now. Some may say <coughs> that the only miracle here is modern medicine. I do agree with you that our technology and abilities in medicine are truly amazing. This is what I live and breathe on a daily basis. My question to those who make such a statement is, show me the perfect test, the perfect treatment, the perfect doctor who has never had a complication, who has never lost a patient. Show me that person or thing, and I will agree with you completely. After 18 years of tr training and experience, I can tell you that the most innocent of illnesses can lead to death, despite all that med modern medicine has to offer, even the common flu. <coughs> On the other hand, others who are near death and we, they come in and we think there's no hope for them to survive, walk out with a smile. I cannot call medicine a miracle at this point because I don't see that it's perfect. Let's say for a moment that I give you that medicine is what saved me. What happens next? What do you do when you start thinking about the what ifs in life? What do you do the next time this happens or something different or something happens to your family? Who or what is gonna save you then? What will cure our health, our finances, our relationships, our brokenness? Do any of us really have a silver bullet for all these answers? So I got home that night and miraculously within 24 hours they let me go. And I hadn't slept for two or three days. That's typical for me but this was even worse. Um, and I passed out that night. I woke up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat wondering was I dead and am I living this new dream life? Or was I really alive? So I pinched myself and it hurt. So I closed my eyes and went back to sleep. I woke up the next morning and uh, I again had that question and fear. So I pinched my wife and she screamed out. So then I knew that I was still alive. I have so many patients after heart attacks who are absolutely terrified about what's happened to them. They have amazing results but they're paralyzed by fear because they realize they're vulnerable. They're afraid of if and when it'll happen again. I can guarantee you that there are no medicines that will take away the demons that we deal with each night as we try to sleep. I believe we're all tools used by God to help people. Our faith cannot be in a test, a pill, or a person. In the end, I cannot extend anyone's life by even a moment. Only someone far greater than me can do that. We are all broken, we are all sinners, and we all have fallen short of the glory of God. I said earlier that man's definition falls short. Why is life unfair? Because of man's brokenness and sin. No matter how hard we try, we all continue to mess up. If you don't believe me, watch the nightly news for a week. What does our brokenness and sin lead to? Death. God's definition of good is also scary. It would mean that we all have to be perfect and we all know that's impossible. This is where God was unfair. He sent his son Jesus, who was perfect, sinless and blameless to climb on the cross to pay for our sins. The most unfair thing that has ever happened is that God took your place and my place on the cross. He died in our place. He gave us freedom for the cost of his life. The cross is the only place where we don't have to be perfect. 
Christ fills in all the gaps. He fills in all the voids of our life. He restores us fully. God's wrath fell on Jesus who took our place so we can stand as free men and free women. Our goodness is no longer based on us, but in Christ. God meets us in the valleys of life to remind us he is with us. He is here to res restore us. Maybe not, maybe not always physically, but definitely spiritually. Jacob had to learn to stop running by being crippled. The lame man had to learn to start walking by being healed. I had to learn to fully depend on God and not fear my brokenness by being crippled and healed. What is your situation? Are you a runner or are you crippled and paralyzed by your circumstances? The question is when we are all in the darkest valleys of our lives, where will we turn? When our health, relationships, money, degrees, powers, family all fail us, where will we turn? When the pleasures of life wear off, what is left to numb the pain? What did I learn from what happened to me? That there is nothing in this world that I can count on. Life is fragile and short. It's nice to have good things, but things will never bring us peace or happiness. We are all but a breath from meeting our maker, and I learned that on April 4th. The Bible says that we are all like a flower of the field, flourishing today and gone tomorrow. There is a God who will never leave us or forsake us. He promises to be with us in the deepest, darkest valley of our lives. He patiently waits for us no matter how much we try to push him away. He is walking with us in the good and in the bad times. We are all broken and scarred inside and out. We can't do it on our own. Our scars don't have to be a sign of weakness, failure, or defeat. It can, in fact, be a sign of victory if we trust in the one who can complete us. Our scars point us to God. We are all scarred. Some of us are dealing with the consequences of our decisions and choices. We have been hurt so bad that we are callous and numb to anything spiritual. Some of us are so scarred that we feel ugly and in no way feel love that we can be loved or forgiven. Can I tell you, the cross is the one place where you can go to have your heart of stone turn back to flesh. The cross is the one place where you can go, where you can be accepted no matter what you've done, no matter how bad the scars may be. And you may be wondering why. Because Jesus himself walked in the valleys we were going through. Long before Jesus was crucified, listen to what Isaiah prophesies about him. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he hardly seemed human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. The cross is a place where there is one who was scarred worse than we could imagine. One who felt more pain than we could ever endure. And one who suffered more sorrow than we could ever handle. He took it all on his shoulders and he remained perfect and sinless. He defeated death and offers us life. If any of you are overwhelmed by life and stuck in darkness, please reach out. There is an answer. There is a place where you can find true peace and freedom. For those of us who believe but have been beaten down by the world, discouraged and distraught, I tell you that your scars are beautiful in God's eyes. That is a lesson that God has taught me. The Bible repeatedly tells us that everything measured in this world is important or showing success is exactly the opposite in God's eyes. For example, the Bible says the first will be last, the last will be first, the wise will be made foolish, and the meek, not the proud, will inherit the earth. Can I tell you, through all that I have been through, what God has taught me is that my scars are not something ugly, it's a thing of beauty. As we are broken, there is less of us and more of him. Jesus can shine through our brokenness. So I encourage you to shine bright. Our scars can be beautiful. The world is not looking for perfect people. Look where that, what that has led to so far. The world is looking for people who can relate to them, feel their pain and suffering, but have an answer, a hope, a promise, and something better to come. Let's stand as lights in the darkness. Let's allow God to work through us and as we become weak, let him become strong. As we shine, people who are desperate for the truth will come to see why we are different, why we have hope, why we are lights in the darkness of this world. We're going to play a song at the end, and then I'll ask Pastor Come to come up and close. It's a song by, called Scars by I Am They. And I would ask you just to close your eyes and just reflect on your life. 
The song has been an anthem to me since I had my rotator cuff fixed in January. For the last four or five months, it's been a struggle, and this has been the song that I've leaned on. My response to the woman I treated with a heart attack was that God is not a genie. He is not going to just give us cars and money and stuff that would make us a bunch of spoiled brats. He longs for a relationship and promises to be with us in the good times and the bad. He promises to make us more like him. Is life unfair? Yes. There is death and sickness and sorrow, famine and wars. Why? Because you and I and every person who lived on this earth is imperfect and messed up what was perfectly made. But God was also unfair. He sent his only perfect son to be shamed, beaten and killed for messed up people like you and me. God provided a way to wash away all that we made wrong. All we have to do is accept Jesus as Savior into our hearts and we are forgiven and free. As I close, I'll leave you with this thought. Would you rather leap through life on your own and figure out every unknown or limp through life with God as your crutch who knew the way before time began? Thank you. God bless you.